Nobody likes to be stressed out. Duh. But did you know there's actually good stress out there? In fact, good stress that can actually save your life? Let's talk about it! Barry Smith here, published author, pastor of 25 years, and a guy who's dealt with his share of stress. Stress is defined as a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. That pretty much sums up what we've been talking about for the last three videos. Stress is a bummer. Nobody wants mental or emotional strain or tension. Nobody wants adverse or demanding circumstances. They're just so stressful. And yet, there are chemicals in the body that rush through our veins, causing severe stress. That happens at just the right time. And it's that stress that might even save our lives. Listen to this story from Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. It was warm and sunny out, a day just like one would expect for that time of the year. There was a calm, gentle breeze that broke the intensity of the sun. It was, by all accounts, a perfect day. All of a sudden, out of the corner of an eye, the calm was shattered. Perhaps it was the rustle of the grass, or maybe he thought he saw something. He couldn't be sure, but frankly, it didn't matter. All that mattered was that there was might have been something out there, something dangerous, something deadly. The anxiety alone was quite enough for the gazelle to stop grazing and immediately lift its head and try to see what it hoped was not a lion. Another gazelle noticed that one of the members of its group was alerted to a possible threat, and it too immediately stopped eating to look up. Two sets of eyes are better than one. Before long, the whole group had joined in. None of them knew what specifically they were looking for. They only knew that if one of the members of the group felt threatened, they should all feel threatened. Then in an instant, one of the gazelles, one that wasn't originally alerted to the potential threat, saw the lion about to pounce and instinctively made a mad dash in the opposite direction. Whether they also saw the lion or not, all the gazelles in the herd followed in the same direction, all running at full speed. The lion attempted to give chase, but couldn't run for long before it ran out of energy. The surprise attack was foiled, and all the gazelles got to live another day. This is one of the primary benefits of group living. Every member of the group can help look out for danger. If one individual in the group senses danger, the whole group can help spot it before it's too late. It's not a biblical book, but it provided much of the science behind this entire series. The story of the gazelle all started with a chemical called cortisol, which caused severe stress. But it's that chemical, that chemical stressor, that saved their lives. If we don't tap into this stress and embrace it, we can literally die. Cortisol causes good stress that saves lives. Some of those gazelles wouldn't be around if it wasn't for cortisol. So not all stress is bad. There's good stress that we desperately need, and that brings us to your message in a tweet. If you don't get anything else, get this. Post this on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, whatever. We all face the stress of danger. It's what we do with it that matters. We all face the stress of danger. It's what we do with it that matters. That's huge. The key is how we respond to the danger. How we respond to the stress. Because not all stress is bad. According to the National Center of Biotechnology Information, it helps us overcome lethargy. It helps us adapt to tough circumstances. It helps an athlete to have a competitive edge. Stress can really be positive stuff. But too often we focus on the negative stress, and that makes it hard to cope. It fatigues our bodies and results in confusion, anxiety, and overreaction. Negative stress has been linked as a major contributing factor to the six leading causes of death in the United States. Cancer, coronary heart disease, accidental injuries, respiratory disorders, cirrhosis of the liver, and suicide. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that stress amounts for 75% of all doctor visits. That's huge. And the Occupational Health and Safety and the National Council of Compensation of Insurance say, and other groups as well, that up to 90% of all the primary care visits are stress-related complaints. In the previous three videos, we've seen how God-given chemicals help us deal with stress, to push through the pain and accomplish a big goal, to form bonds of trust that we can help each other. And all these chemicals produce feelings, but the problem is those feelings can be deceptive. We saw how Jesus leveraged those chemicals and the feelings in his stress-filled life and how Jesus submitted to the Spirit and not the flesh. Do we react in the Spirit or the flesh, especially with stress? Jesus gave his disciples the last instructions in Acts 1. He said, wait for the Holy Spirit. Here's your memory verse. 
But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So they waited. The day of Pentecost comes, the Holy Spirit shows up, Peter preaches the first gospel message ever recorded, which basically said, listen, you killed the Messiah, but God raised him from the dead. So here's what you need to do. You need to repent and be baptized. So about 3,000 plus people that day were baptized right then. The church was now in session. The 12 apostles were told, you need to go and spread the good news. And they did, but they were also persecuted for it. In Acts chapter five, the disciples were highly regarded and all kinds of people were choosing Jesus. People were getting healed, even by Peter's shadow going by. But the religious leaders hated it. They were jealous. So they put these disciples in jail. God releases them from jail and says, listen, go out in the temple courts and tell these people about this great new life. And so they did. And it was exciting, but it was also dangerous. They're taking heat from the jealous religious leaders. Pretty severe. They heard about a guy by the name of Stephen in Acts 7 and 8 who Saul had stoned to death because he stood up and taught good things about God and Jesus. And just like the gazelles, the believers' heads perk up. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned for, deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Saul was the religious of all religious leaders. There wasn't a law or a ritual that he didn't follow. But Jesus, we're not following him. No way. This is bad news. So he sets out to imprison and even kill the followers of Jesus. The believer's ears perk up, danger, cortisol's running, we need to run, the adrenaline's going. And so in Samaria, the guy named Philip, he's sharing the good news. And remember, Jesus had said, you're going to get power, and you're going to witness in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Samaria is about 35-mile walk from Jerusalem, which is just another step of the church going to the ends of the earth. But then there's this guy named Saul that was out to persecute him. Saul heads out to Damascus to imprison believers and even kill them. And on the way, God blinds Saul and tells him that Jesus is the real deal and you need to go to a guy by the name of Ananias. So Saul did. Now Ananias was a God-fearing man and he'd heard about Saul. And God tells Ananias, you need to go to the house and ask for a guy named Saul. He's praying and he knows that you're coming to place hands on him and restore his sight. Acts 9 verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests and to arrest all, all who call on your name. Um, he's saying, God, pardon my cortisol here, but this guy is seriously dangerous. This seems like a pretty crazy idea, God. And we do the same thing. Has God ever asked you to do something that just seems so crazy? To go talk to a stranger or invite somebody that's really far from God to church or to go back and help that guy on the street that you saw or maybe even sell your house and give all the equity to God? That actually happened in my church plan. And we all had cortisol going through our veins and we're going, listen, this is dangerous. You're both so young and it took so long to buy this house and get this equity. This could really hurt you long term. But they said, listen, God has given us explicit instructions. We must do this. Okay, then let's do it and celebrate it. Ananias just needed some assurance from God that this is really what him to do, to enter this house, this danger zone of this killer Saul. Verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. God says, Ananias, trust me, don't run because I want to reach billions of future Gentiles. Have the courage to do what you know is right, no matter how hard it seems or how dangerous this may seem in your own mind. And that brings us back to your message in a tweet. We all face danger. It's what we do with it that matters. And if we do what God asks, no matter how scared we might be, it's the right thing to do. There's some benefits of perceived danger. Danger can help us act quickly. 
When something goes bump in the night and your heart is about to beat out of your chest because you don't know what it is, you got to move quickly because there might actually be danger out there. It might be nothing too, but there might be. Or you, you need to get over it and just let it go. Because long term, cortisol in our system isn't good. Cortisol stress with no resolve decreases your immune system to fight off infection. It decreases metabolism and even keeps us from losing belly fat. It can break down muscle tissue if it's not dealt with. We need to deal with potential danger quickly. Danger can help us avoid catastrophic consequences. It puts us on notice to go nip that thing in the bud and protect ourselves from a potential catastrophe. Whether it's the first century church scattering to the ends of the earth or getting out of bed and turning on the security lights outside to send that robber right on down the street. God-given chemicals can help us avoid serious problems in the future and reduce a lot of future stress, might even get rid of some belly fat. Danger can help us build confidence. But I'm sure Ananias was afraid to talk to Saul, but he rose above his feelings and his fear and he obeyed. He didn't follow the flesh, he followed the spirit. And I'm sure Ananias was more confident afterwards in himself, in God, in his future ministry, and the challenges to come. A couple of observations about danger and fear though. What we think is negative could actually be exactly what God wants for us. We have to remap our mind. Think of danger as a positive. Imagine if you retrained your brain that everything that's dangerous isn't always negative. If you weren't afraid to fail or get hurt, imagine what you could do for God and his kingdom. Imagine the, your faith that you would share when cortisol kicks in for you and do you panic and run or do you go to God? When Saul meets Jesus, his life is completely turned around. In fact, he becomes one of the greatest Christian leaders of all time. He went on three missionary journeys. He planted numerous churches. He wrote well over 30% of the entire New Testament in our Bibles. This is the same guy who organized a sting to jail and kill believers. Talk about a turnaround. That tells me that God's love can change anyone, even you. But had there not been cortisol to signal danger, the church might not have been scattered. Did you ever think about that? Who knows if we'd even be here? The whole church could have just died out. God gives us chemicals to help us deal with stress. And the biggest stress anyone could ever have is where are you going to go when you die? There is a real heaven and there is a real hell and you're going to go to one of those two places when you die. God sent his only son so that you could go to heaven for sure. Is it time for you to choose Jesus and cross the line of faith? Don't run. Face it. It's how we respond to the chemicals and the feelings that they cause. That's the real issue at hand. When we have that moment where we know that danger is lurking around the corner, our next move can be heroic or catastrophic. Choose Jesus. Feel the moment. Feel the stress. Feel the pressure. And then face it head on and choose Jesus. In fact, if you want to give your life to Christ, or you already given your life to Christ, put choose Jesus in the comments below. Choose Jesus. Just do that right now. Not all stress is bad, and cortisol, when dealt with and responded to, is a good stress chemical. In all stress and the chemicals that pour through our veins, we need to choose the spirit and not the flesh. It may not be comfortable, but it's right, and God gives us his spirit to get through the good and the bad. Comment below, choose Jesus, if you're trusting in him now or you want to. And as always, like, share, comment, subscribe to our videos. That helps us get the word out there, the message out there to people. So right now, go ahead, give us a thumbs up and share this thing, because no doubt someone you know probably needs to hear this. And don't forget to post in the comments below, choose Jesus. Until next time, choose the spirit, not the flesh.